So, I'm happy to deliver this video. It's a little bit later than I expected. I've been doing everything on a two-day cycle, so you'll probably see this uh, probably December, early December. But let me start out the video with this. <clears throat> if you want the best gaming consumer-grade CPU on the market, the i9-9900K is the CPU to buy. Absolutely no argument for me. I don't have an unlimited budget. I'm an adult. <laughs> I have bills to pay. So that's why I went with the 2700X. It just fit my budget and allowed me to spend more money on other products, right? However, people say, well, when graphics cards can handle 4K, let's take a trip back a couple years. Let's talk about Battlefield 4. Let's talk about Crisis 3. Let's talk about some more demanding games back when 1440p became pretty popular. To this day, as you've seen, or as you will see in these benchmarks, the 1080 Ti is bottlenecked at 1440p, just like the 980 was bottlenecked at 1440p. The graphics cards may eventually catch up, but what's happening is these games are looking better and better and requiring more and more graphical power. Ghost Recon Wildlands, you'll see we can't even crack 100 FPS on the second highest settings at 1440p on an average, on either platform, right? So why would you spend an extra $200 plus on a chip, an extra $100 to $150 on a board, if it's not going to yield any real-world results? In the future, it probably still won't run the real-world results, unless you decide to do 1080p StarCraft 2. At that point, why you spend this much money? You can get by with like an unlocked i5 or something, or unlocked i3 at that matter. So. That's why these real world results matter. Because in five years, the GPU bottleneck's not going to disappear. And we're moving away from 1080p and going higher resolutions. So what we're looking at today is real world tests. We're talking uh, Ryzen 7 2700X at the default XFR. The i9-9900K also has default uh, 4.7 GHz all-core boost, which it was running. And we're going to compare them. See which one performs better with a 1080 Ti at 1440p with either max or near max settings. And then we're going to compare system cost. Not platform cost because AMD is going to win that one. We're going to look at system cost. So I ask you to come along for a ride. I think the results, which I do know, are quite interesting. While the conclusion for me is what I was hoping to get, I want to show you guys how I got there. Let's take a look at the test system. So the CPU and the boards were variables. Everything else was the same. Now, the CPUs we used were obviously the i9-9900K and the Ryzen 7 2700X. We paired up with the Gigabyte Aorus Master Z390. It is a relatively expensive board, but it's the only board that has a 6 plus 2 power phase for this CPU at the time that we did the test. And we paired up against the Ryzen 7 2700X with an Asus X470 Pro. Not a very cheap board. I think it's about $160. So we're trying to keep this as fair as possible. The rest of the test bench was the same. The Cryorig R1 Ultimate. Um, we used it for both systems. Uh, we actually got two, so that was convenient. We have a 4x16 kit of DDR4 at 3000 megahertz. We have a 512 gig NVMe SSD by Samsung, a 500 gig external SSD, which we ran all the games off of, an EVGA GTX 1080 for the win edition, not overclocked, we just kept that same, an EVGA G2 850 watt 80 plus gold power supply, a very big uh, Fantex uh, into full tower case i can't remember the name the test bench cost around 1600 then you add in the cost of the cpu and the board we'll talk about that later on let's take a look at the test conditions next now i do real world tests when it comes to cpu gpu maybe not so much but especially with cpu and what we're looking at is we have hardware hardware monitor open gpu z cpu z Chrome with four tabs open. We had YouTube homepage, the last tech tips, the wild forums, and my website, as well as Discord open, not logged into any particular server. And then this is what the default settings look like. For AMD, we went with XFR 2.0. What that looked like, a single core hit around 4.3 and an all core hit around 4.1, 4.05 to 4.1. It did not thermal throttle. It's important to note because that we use the default profile for the Intel build. Now on the gigabyte board, there's a couple settings. The one we went with had a single core boost up to five gigahertz with an all core boost at 4.7. In this particular test, it did not thermal throttle. All core boost at five gigahertz did have some thermal issues. That's why we had to back it down. 
Then we use 3000 megahertz RAM. Uh, we just use the XMP or the DOCP settings and it's a CL16 kit. Let's start taking a look at a couple synthetics, then some gaming benchmarks. As much as I'm not a fan of synthetics in many scenarios, I love Cinebench. This is the early part of the story, and this is the single core performance. There's quite a bit of a difference. It's around 20, it's just like 39 or 19 percent increase in single thread performance. There's about a 20 percent increase in performance and clock speed almost, so it, it's to be expected. But obviously, 9900K took the victory here but what's really interesting is the multi-core performance and that's because the performance was a bit less now this isn't your father's bulldozer architecture the multi-core and single core performance on ryzen is very solid i was actually really surprised at five gigahertz it didn't quite thermal throttle hit like 88 89 degrees in, in those particular tests it only scored like 2000 like 80 or 2090 it wasn't substantial uh it could have been thermal throttling but at 4.7 gigahertz it scored 198 points higher which in this particular test is a hair over 10 percent but the clock speed is significantly faster 4.7 all core versus 4.05 to 4.1 so that i find incredibly interesting but for 3D Mark time spot, I'm only reporting the CPU portion because actually the Ryzen squeaked out like 30 points on one test and it just, it's not relevant, right? The CPU test is relevant. This is again, when we see about a 20% difference. Um, it's interesting because while this isn't a real world scenario, it's also not you know, a gaming scenario either. So definitely a 20% win, no doubt, something to be expected. But let's take a look at Ashes of the Singularity because that's always an interesting benchmark when it comes to CPUs. And I like Ashes of the Singularity for one main reason. I ran the CPU only version test, right? And it got a, I think it was around like eight, 16, 17% difference. But I wanted to run the CPU or GPU test and report the average CPU uh, frame rate, 1440p extreme settings. And here we see about a seven to maybe 8% difference, despite there being, you know, a, pr a better, slightly better architecture with Intel and the clock speed advantage. And supposedly, and this is kind of what I'm thinking the result, the uh, resolution might come to, the IPC difference clock for clock may not be there like everybody thinks. And for honor, not a big difference. Uh, one and a half, one and three quarters, not not quite two percent. It's a hair under two percent difference, nearly margin of error. They're averaging in the mid 120 FPS, which means 144 um, hertz gaming at 1440p. And this was max settings because the GPU bottleneck came at near 144 FPS. So I was okay with those results because I'm trying to deliver to you the actual experience you can expect to have. 1080p low settings, if you're going to do the 1080 Ti and, and an i9, you're wasting your time. You're going to want 1440p and try to get as close to 144 hertz as possible uh, with the best detail you can possibly get. And that's what I did here. And as you can see, almost the exact same performance. The lows, the lows were very equal. Uh, I think they were sitting like around like 105 and 108. So very similar performance on both ends. Now here we have Rise of the Tomb Raider and it still holds true to be a pretty demanding game overall. And again, what we're seeing here is max settings, motion blur off. I just, I don't like motion blur. A lot of people don't like motion blur, so that's why I keep it off. And we're we're a little less than the last game. We're around 118, but it's pretty much a deadlock. Margin of error, uh, good for 1440p, 144 hertz gaming. Both CPUs are definitely there. We're still running to the GPU bottleneck. And uh, let's keep going, because this is kind of an interesting uh, series of results that we're getting. And in Final Fantasy 15, I think that's actually what this is. Yeah, Final Fantasy 15, really close again. I mean, we're talking 150 points out of 8,000. So to give you an idea, 800 points would be 10%. We're talking 2%, 1.5%. Again, <clears throat> 1440p, high settings. They're both performing really good for high refresh rate gaming. We're hitting the GPU barrier even with a 1080 Ti. That is still building on my previous speculation, but Ghost Recon Wildlands followed by GTA 5 just might turn the table since they seem to just take a lot of CPU power, or in the case of Ghost Recon Wildlands, just a lot of power in general. 
In the case of Ghost Recon Wildlands, we're starting to see a little bit of separation. It's not almost noticeable. I mean, five FPS when you're looking around 90 isn't necessarily huge, but it's definitely something to note. What I thought was interesting, you don't see this in the graph, was the 9900K had a low of like 69 and the Ryzen 7 a low of 72. I thought that was interesting. A little bit bigger of a margin there. And we only could run very high settings. As you see at very high, which is the second highest settings, we're hitting the GPU limit, uh, arguably the second, tied for second best gaming GPU on the market, not including obviously the Titan series graphics cards. So I would go to say that as you loosen up the settings a little bit, you might get a little bit more separation. But in this case, we're about 4.5%. Really not a big difference quite yet. But there's GTA 5, and GTA 5 is a CPU-bound game to a decent degree. So let's take a look at what that gave us. Contrary to what some of you might say, I actually tweaked the settings in the favor of Intel where I could. Now, give me an example. 1440p pretty much max settings with anti-aliasing all the way up. They were dead even. They were like 65 FPS. But this is 1440p 144 hertz game with the exception of Ghost Recon Wildlands because that game just requires so much power and to reduce it the medium didn't make sense. But here we definitely saw some separation and the separation was pretty big. It's about 18%, 18, 19%. And, you know, the Ryzen 7 does put up a uh, good performance given its value proposition, but the 9900K clearly wins, no doubt about it. It's a more powerful chip, it's faster, it's much more expensive, but here's where we're starting to see some separation similar to the synthetic benchmarks. And you're gonna kind of see this in anything that's really CPU bound. World of Warcraft, if you want them, Starcraft 2 being huge. That being said, not to say it's not playable, it's just you will see the separation and the performance difference. But I want to show you guys a couple more things before we wrap up because I think I'm trying to be really straightforward and realistic. And I think these next couple results is really going to drive home my point. Now, averaging the performance of all the games, clearly 9900K is the winner. It performed better in every game, either by margin of error or by a decent margin like GTA 5. When you pin them up against each other, at 1440p, the 9900K squeaked out about a 9.76% better performance. It straight up did. But what's important to note is what you're going to see next, which is the total system cost of my customer's system, and then we're going to compare it to the performance and see the overall value you get. When you take the roughly $1,600 of system cost, and we got really good deal on the RAM, and that was before DRAM prices went up, because... The original basis system is a Threadripper system from like over a year ago. So just keep that in mind, price of change. But uh, $1,600 is kind of where we started. And then when you add my CPU and board, I think we came to like $2,025, somewhere around there. And then you take his system, and then again, and then you add the i9 and the board. There's about a right around 400, like $396 difference. So that's really important because we don't want to just compare the platform. We want to compare the total system. And that actually is going to give um, an advantage to Intel, right? Because the higher the, you know, $396 when you're looking at uh, six, seven, eight hundred dollars $800 is a lot bigger of a difference than when we're looking at like $2,400, for example. So let's take a look at the next slide because that's really going to drive home the overall point of this video. Let me explain what you're looking at. We took the gaming benchmarks only, not the synthetics or anything, gaming benchmarks. We averaged them together and then we took the total cost divided by the frame rate. So what this is showing you is how much money you need to spend for each frame that, that you got in these games. And the lower is better. So the Intel system is 20% more. It performs 10% better. There's a 10% difference in there. And lo and behold, the Ryzen 7 wins the dollar per FPS by 10%. It's actually, usually doesn't work out that way, but that's pretty much what we're looking at today. And I wanted to do total system cost because it's not fair when you have an $800 platform versus a $400 platform and the $800 platform only performs 20% better, then you're going to scream, Ryzen's better. It's a better value. Yes, it is. But you need to look at total system cost. 
And we alluded to that in the previous video with the Kohler showdown. And that was, if you're looking to just buy a Kohler, get the $16 Kohler, even though it performs a little bit worse. When you're looking at total system cost, you're only spending $15 more on an eight, nine hundred thousand dollar system. Then it's worth to get a couple degrees better. And that's why I wanted to do this um, particular result because I want to do it that way as well because it shows you the whole picture and that's what I think where a lot of people on AMD bandwagon fall off and I do love the Ryzen processors is they only compare the cost of the platform not the cost of the rest of the system and that's important to the buyer $2,000 versus 2400 and you're getting in gaming real world about a 10% increase in, in the realistic sense not the theoretical sense but, as you'll see in my conclusion, there are definitely reasons to buy the 9900K. Maybe not for gaming necessarily, unless you have the budget, which I'll cover that. But there's definitely some reasons, but let's go ahead and wrap it up. So, conclusion time. Where we saw the too long didn't read is in the average system that you would look at. The i9-9900K platform is going to run you 15 in some cases, if you spend a little bit less on the board, the 20, we'll say 20% more than the Ryzen platform in many cases. Arguments you made, you wouldn't get 64 gigs of RAM for Ryzen, but we'll leave that go. And you get about 10% real world gaming performance at 1440p. That's a too long didn't read. But here's the bigger answer the 9900K is by far the most powerful gaming CPU out there. I actually had a good time with it. I wish I would have had better cooling. We would have, you know, spent maybe like $180 on a higher-end liquid cooler because at 5 gigahertz, we didn't have to change anything. We just, one setting in the board, literally, like you changed it from uh, High Performance Ultra or whatever, and it went to 5 gigahertz. It is the best gaming CPU on the market. If you have the money, definitely go for it. You're going to be good for quite a while. Make sure you get enough cooling. Make sure you get the right board. There's videos floating around about that. If you're big, really big into Adobe, 9900K does amazing. With Quick Sync, it'll definitely give you a sizable performance. I would go to say that it might even give you that 20% performance over the Ryzen platform when you deal with really high-end Adobe work. So that's, that's kind of the other part to it. But here's where I'm really interested to talk about, and that is the Ryzen platform can do 144 hertz, no problem. As you saw, we're going to hit the GPU. The GPU is going to be the limiting factor. Clearly, if it did most games uh, 1440p 144 hertz, then 1080p 144 hertz is going to be doable by any of the Ryzen chips that can hit above 4 gigahertz or around 4 gigahertz all core speed. So that's probably one of the bigger takeaways. And I wanted to do the real world performance. And kind of what we talked about earlier at the beginning of this video is that a couple of years ago when 1440p was big, when we had 980s and 980Ti's or you run uh, 780Ti's and SLI, you had trouble running 1440p performance years ago. Yes, the graphics cards are getting more powerful. The games are demanding more power as well. It's going to take an interesting part in the graphics card community. It's going to take AMD a step up. They're struggling on the high end to try to overcome the performances you're running into. Single cards still can't push 4K very easily in some of these modern titles. You know, Ghost Recon Wildlands, for example, Far Cry 5, they're, they're, they're struggling. And 1440p high refresh rate, they're not there yet either. So who's to say in five years we'll, we'll, we'll be there when we weren't there five years from when it first came out, right? So that's kind of anybody that says, well, you know, uh, it'll be there when graphics cards catch up. Well, they're not because the gaming industry is not staying stagnant. It's getting better and better, and the details are getting better and better, and they require more and more power. And that's going to be the trend going forward. So just keep that in mind when you're doing your purchasing. If you have to budget, make some cuts. I proved that it, depending on what you're doing, it might make sense to go Ryzen over i9 if you're sacrificing a lot in the graphics cards. There's a $400 difference. But the i9 still is the best gaming CPU on the market, hands down. Hands down, I'm not saying that AMD is better. It's not. It's just, I'm not dumb. It's not. But if you guys want to buy anything featured in this video, I have a couple workstations set up, and the, but we'll just do that stuff. Um, click in the description below. You can definitely buy it. If you like this video, definitely like it. If you dislike this video, obviously dislike, but, but talk to me because I think this was a very fair video. I think that I stayed very neutral and tried to actually tailor it more towards Intel since obviously I do a lot of Ryzen, right? So 
you know, I would definitely like the feedback. But as always, this is Steve from PC Budget Solutions, and I'll see you later on down the road.